I serve a risen Savior, and he lives within my heart today. Amen? Amen. I'm going to try that one more time. I serve a risen Savior, and he lives within my heart. Amen? Amen? There's my man right there. Let's stand together, and let's sing this great hymn together. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with singing so well take your seat listen to this old old song called the unseen hand
Amen. You may be seated. That's a good song right there, isn't it? It reminded me of Psalm 23, where the psalmist David writes, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And then watch this. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. His unseen hand guides us. He leads us. And because of that, we do not want. Would you bow with me? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you as your people. God, as your church, and we thank you that you are a God who is close to us. You are a God who speaks creation into existence, yet you are a God who dwells within us. And God, we say thank you. Lord, we trust your leading hand. We trust you in the moments that we don't know where you're leading us, how you're leading us. But God, we trust that you are leading us. God, we praise you in the moments when you reveal your leading to us. And we say thank you. 
God, I pray as we worship you this morning that our hearts, that our lives would be um, surrendered to you. And God, that you would have your way as only you can. Lord, we love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to First Baptist Church of Hendersonville this morning to our 945 service. Uh, if you're a guest with us, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. Uh, we are grateful that you took your time to be here this morning. Uh, hopefully, when you arrive, you received a bulletin. Inside that bulletin, there's some information about the church, but there's also a little section there that says, Welcome Guests. And we would love for you to fill that out at the end of the service. Our pastor, uh, myself, will be out in the foyer. We'd love to meet you. Uh, so you can drop that by there. Um, if you didn't get a bulletin, you can grab one on the way out. But also in the pew in front of you, in the back of that pew, there is a card there that you can fill out. We'd love for you to do that. Our church is about connecting every generation to God, to others, and to service. And so we want to be able to connect with you and walk with you on your journey. So again, thank you for being here. We're grateful for you. Uh, we're excited this morning uh, to introduce some folks to you. Uh, Pastor, why don't you come up? Ben, uh, why don't you guys come up? With Bo, our, uh, Ben Baxley leads our adult ministry, and he's been on a search for a long time uh, for somebody to come in and give leadership to our college ministry, and we're excited to be able to present to you uh, this wonderful couple. Pastor, Ben, <laughs> Brandon. Good morning, y'all. It's my privilege to introduce you guys to Bo and Hannah. This is Bo. This is Hannah. <laughs> Griswold, and, and Bo comes to you as a candidate uh, from me, um, from Bruce Rayleigh, Pastor Chesser, and our personnel team uh, for our college and young professionals minister position. We've been in a search for about two years. Um, we wanted to take our time and, and, and find who, exactly who the Lord wanted to lead into this position. And we believe the Lord's brought uh, Bo and Hannah here at just a wonderful, wonderful time. We're seeing uh, some powerful things happen. Uh, in our college young pro crew, uh, there's the, the Lord's done a lot of neat things, calling people into ministry missions, um, and we're seeing those folks serve like crazy all over the place. And so I'm just so thrilled that Bo is going to land here and continue to lead. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Been married for two years, uh, and Bo has served in, in some staff positions on, in, in churches for about five years. Uh, they are expecting a little girl, Lily, in December. Um, they are, that's right, we're looking forward. So they want to get settled uh, between now and then. They're really grateful we're voting now. Um, and so, uh, and, and they, they're, they're uh, UT alums. Uh, and see, even, even better, right? And, and we, we're just so excited. People, people, that we had a blast uh, hanging out with some of our college students last night. And I can already see how the Lord's forming uh, bonds and relationships here. And so we're, we're just really grateful to celebrate this moment today. I'm going to let Pastor um, lead us in this recommendation together. All right, before we do that, I've got to ask, did I just hear the theme, the good, the bad, and the ugly, come from over in this section? I've heard some strange ringtones, but in church, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll say the good. Which one do you want? I think it's self-explanatory. We'll go the good, the bad, and the ugly. I don't know. I... I'd be willing to bet that they never, ever let that phone go off in church again. Well, I... you know, it's funny when you're standing here in church and you hear this theme and you're thinking to yourself, that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Where is that, where is that coming from? Okay. Well, hey, we're so glad to have Bo and Hannah Griswold coming to our church. So for the first time, maybe in the history of the church, this December, we will have a Griswold Christmas. It's going That's to right. be great. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, get a life. Come on. You, you, sh you should know that. Not only has Bo been involved in uh, ministry there at Calvary Baptist Church, but Hannah uh, has also been working with the Knox County Baptist Association, the, church, the Southern Baptist Churches there in the Knoxville area. Matter of fact, Bruce Raley and I were over there a few months ago to do a conference, and, and Hannah was helping us. Little did I know then that they would be coming to our uh, team here. 
But uh, I, we're so excited about this. It comes as a recommendation from Ben, who will be Bo's immediate supervisor, from Pastor Bruce. and He and I both have had a chance to meet with them. But most importantly, from our personnel team who have sat and talked with them. And we really believe that this is uh, the next step for us in our young single adults and our college uh, age ministry. So if you support that recommendation and vote to affirm that today, let that be known by saying amen. amen. Any opposed? And that was rousing. Before I pray for them, you have a very mean-spirited thing that you're going to do. So I, go ahead. I feel like I feel like it's I feel like it's it's not that mean. Okay, go as ahead. far as but uh, so we normally we love uh, to when we're bringing somebody here, uh, a staff member, especially from somewhere else. We we try to make sure we get them some Tennessee swag. But they grew up here in, in the Brentwood area, and so we they've already got all that. And so we were trying to think through what does a UT fan really need and and so I found you some UT themed golf balls um, and and I just felt like you might be missing some you know might be missing some golf balls and listen these are designed to hit off a tee uh, with a club so I just just want want to make sure you remember that but uh, no we're so excited we're grateful uh, for Bo and Hannah and for the chance um, to see the Lord use them powerfully in the days to come I'm just glad you didn't bring a mustard bottle thank you for Thank you for that. Well, let me pray for this couple. Let me get over here between y'all. Lord, I do thank you for Bo and Hannah and for what you're going to do through them with us and for us. And I pray for the, the baby, uh, for a safe arrival uh, this December for Hannah and the baby both. I pray that, that their adjustment would be uh, quick here in this area, that they'd be able to find... Uh, everything they need as far as living arrangements and all those things, that you just bless them as we get to know them, they get to know us, and that together we could see great things happen with our young single adults in college. We thank you for sending them to us in Jesus' name. Amen. They're going to slip out and go visit some of the young adult connect groups, so uh, we'll see you again at 11 o'clock, Bo and Hannah. Oh, I wanted so badly to say, Bo, we want to get you something real nice. I didn't get a chance to say a dog on it. Well, let's stand together more about Jesus. This is my prayer. I want to know more about him, and I want to know more about he, what he does for me. Let's sing this together. More about Jesus. More about Jesus would I know. Thank you for that great singing. You may be seated.
pour it out, pour it out. Jesus knows just how much it will cost you. Pour it out, pour it out. He is near, always near. He is near to the broken hearted. He is here.
Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jason, for that earlier song. Choir and orchestra, as always, thank you for a great, great job. Well, I hope you uh, were one of the few that went out to Smiley Hollow last week. Wasn't that a great experience? Best picnic we've ever had. Great attendance, great weather. I've already put in a request for that same weather next year at this time, and we'll do it again. And uh, Just a wonderful experience, and I would be... Uh, remiss if I did not thank the many people who made that possible. Anything like that of that magnitude doesn't just happen. There are a lot of people that do a lot of work, and so I appreciate all the volunteers from the car show to the food to, to everything that happened, the children's activities, all the things that happened. It was just a great uh, afternoon and evening, and thank you for being a part of it. Uh, also, I want to say thank you for your patience for the past couple of weeks as we've been repaving the parking lot. The contractors have worked with us to try to do sections so that the weekly day-to-day uh, -day activities could carry on without a lot of disruption, but there had to be some disruption to make it happen. And you've been very patient about that. And Lord willing, and the weather cooperates, they will finish all that up this week, get everything uh, done and all of the uh, uh, striping done. It's kind of like... Um, bumper cars out there this morning without stripes it's funny watching people park every every parking becomes handicapped because you you leave enough room between you and the car beside you to park another car but uh, that's okay and uh, we'll get it all finished up this week and get it striped and ready to go so thank you for your patience on that well our scripture today is in the book of philippians we're in the third chapter i want to look at two verses today and there's enough material in two verses for us to just spend our time on. I really want to focus on what Paul says in these two verses in Philippians chapter 3. Now, if you were here last week, I mentioned this, but I want to mention it again because this is so key in understanding Paul's life. Before he became a follower of Jesus, his name was not Paul. His name was Saul. He was a rabbi, a Pharisee, and he spent his life, his calling was to try to squelch this uprising of Jewish people who had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy, and they've been following Jesus. And it was his job to stop that, to put an end to it, and in any, using any means necessary, and that's what he had set his life to do. Now, the people who were following Jesus at that time, you'll hear this in a scripture I'm about to read, they weren't called Christians yet, they were called the, the people of the way, W-A-Y, the way, and they were called that because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now the event that changed Paul's life is found in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Paul was on his way from Jerusalem in Israel to Damascus in Syria, and he was going there for the purpose of squelching another uprising. He was going to find some of these followers of the way and either arrest them, bring them back to Jerusalem, or do whatever he needed to do to stop this. And so listen to the, to, to the way it's recorded in the ninth chapter of Acts. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He answered. This is the answer. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, it was that day that Paul met Jesus. It was that day that his life changed. His purpose changed. His belief system changed. His job changed. His eternity changed. Everything changed when he met Jesus. So the obvious question today is, have you met Jesus? Now, the good news is that most people that will gather in this room today would answer that question affirmatively. And if that's the case for you, then my goal, my prayer, my aim today is that having known him, knowing him now, that your goal would be to know him better in the days ahead. If there's someone that's in this room right now or will be through the morning and you cannot affirmatively answer that question, have you ever met Jesus, my prayer, my prayer, Goal. my aim would be to introduce you to him. Because just like for Saul, 
for whom everything changed when he met Jesus. If you meet Jesus, everything in your life will change and it will change for the better. Now, I want you to listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. And let me remind you that he's already spoken this, this phrase back up in verse uh, verse 8 it says more than that I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord so he's already talked about knowing him but then look at what he says in verse 10 this is our passage for today Philippians chapter 10 verse 11 and 12 excuse me verse 10 and 11 he says my goal is to know him now underline those words my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. My goal is to know him. Now, wait a minute, Paul. Wait just a minute. How can you say that? How can you say your goal is to know him and you've known him for a long time? You've been serving him. You've been planting churches that bear his name. You've been leading men, women, boys, and girls to faith in Jesus. You've been preaching about Jesus. You've been talking about Jesus. You've been writing about Jesus. You are in prison right now because you have followed Jesus. So how is it, after all of that, how is it that you say, my goal is to know him? You've known him forever. It's a reminder, isn't it, that sometimes you can think you know someone and you only get to know them better. You know, when you're dating somebody, you think you know them, and you do know them pretty well. You know them well enough to know that you want to spend your life with them. They want to spend their life with you. You make a commitment to do that with each other. But you know, no matter how well we know each other or think we know each other when we're dating, we get to know each other when we get married, right? All of a sudden, we're not just putting on a facade anymore and always putting our best foot forward. All of a sudden... Maybe who we really are comes out more in conversation and in the way that we respond to things. We may think we know a person, but we really get to know them when we get married, right? And there's a difference in knowing about somebody and knowing somebody. I know about a lot of people that I've never met. I've read about them. I've heard about them. I, I, I can name a lot of people, as you could, that, that we're pretty familiar with. We can give facts and information, but we've never met them. We don't really know them. Have you ever talked with someone, maybe a friend of yours, and you realize that they know somebody that's kind of well-known, somebody that's famous, and, and you ask them this question. You say, what, what are they really like? What are they really like? I, I see the persona. I, I, I see the public presentation. I, I, I see what they're like uh, you, you, when they're in, in front of a bunch of people. But what are they really like? That's what he's talking about. I want to know him. I don't want to just know about him. I don't want just information. I want to know him. Now, when you get to know him, he's going to bring some things into your life. Now, there are other things in this passage that I won't refer to, that you'll see that God puts on your heart. But I want to show you three things that jumped off the page to me. Three things that I think when you know him, when you really know him, three things that this passage says will be a part of your life. Look at it with me in verse 10. It says, my goal is to know him, here's the first one, and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. So Paul says the first thing that happens when we get to know him, according to this passage, is that we begin to experience, we begin to live, we begin to, to see a power that we've never seen before. You know, Paul wrote uh, to the Romans in Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter uh, 5, in verse 6, he said, For while we were still powerless, some translations say, Helpless. While we were still powerless at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, we know something about earthly power. We know something about physical power. If you watch football games yesterday or if you watch any today, I'll, I, I, I'm, a, I'm sure you saw this happen at least once, maybe multiple times in the same game. It's an amazing thing. It happens all the time. You'll see a running back run into the line and two or three defensive linemen will hit that running back and maybe a couple of linebackers come in behind them and you think, well, that play is dead. There's no way he can go any further. And all of a sudden, that whole little group of players just starts moving. 
How is it that one running back can take several 300-pound defensive linemen and linebackers, and when they all have a hold of this running back, how is it that that whole little glob of humanity just keeps moving down the field? They may go five more yards. They may go ten more yards. You've seen a weightlifter that has incredible power. They're able to take hundreds and hundreds of pounds and lift them in a dead lift and pull them up to their shoulders and then press it above their head. Those are examples of great, amazing human strength. But you know those same two athletes? That running back that can move that 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 humanity down the field, that weightlifter that can lift hundreds of pounds, they may not have the strength to control their own emotions. They may not have the power to, to, to control their temper. They may not have the strength to, to be a godly husband or a godly father or to, to, to live life according to the way that life should be lived. They may have unbelievable human physical strength, but they don't have that kind of power. Paul said in Romans chapter 5, we are helpless, we are powerless in this spiritual realm. And so the thing that he says that he wants as he gets to know him, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. You know, we live in a world that, that, that there, there's so much incredible technology and invention and science that's all around us. And when we think about what the, the differences we've seen in our lifetime, cell phones and the Internet and something like high-definition television and just all of the amazing technological advances that have happened around us, it, it, we live in an amazing day. You and I would agree with that. We live in an amazing day. But let me tell you something that science and technology and, and, and all of these brilliant people, let me tell you something that they're never going to be able to do. They're never going to be able to resurrect someone back to life from death. They're not ever going to be able to do that. Have you read about cryonics? Cryonics is this weird, some call it a science, it's more voodoo I think than real science but it's this idea that you can take a corpse when a person dies you don't even have to have the whole body you can cut the head off and you can freeze that head or freeze that body and keep it in frozen animation until such time that technology according to these people when technology is going to catch up and then you'll thaw out that head and attach it I don't know where you're going to get the headless body to attach it to I, I don't know that they figured that out but you reattach this head or you, you, you thaw out this body and life is brought back into it and they will continue to live now I've got one thought for that good luck Good luck making that work. You know, that no one's ever going to recreate life from death. You see, that's, that's the thing that as those that watched Jesus, as they observed the way he lived his life, it, that was where the true power of God was demonstrated. Now, God demonstrated his power in a lot of ways. He demonstrated his power in creation. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. He created his power when he, when, or he demonstrated his power when he created male and female, which are, by the way, the only two genders, regardless of what people say these days. They're only two genders. God created them, male and female, and God created those two genders and only those two genders so that as they come together in that physical union that they can recreate themselves, that they can reproduce themselves in life. God d demonstrated his power when he gave us that ability. God demonstrated his power through miracles as you read through the Bible. God demonstrated his power in many ways, but there has never been a demonstration of God's power like when Jesus died on a cross and was raised back to life. That is the incredible expression the most incredible expression of the power of God and Paul said I want to know him and the power of his resurrection now you, you saw that Paul did not say I want to know about him he said I want to know him now had Jesus not been resurrected from the dead Paul could not have said I want to know him all he could have said was I want to know about him because he's dead I can't introduce you to Muhammad today because Muhammad's dead. I can't introduce you to Buddha because Buddha is dead. 
But I can introduce you to Jesus today because Jesus died on a cross and was raised back to life and Jesus lives today and will live forevermore. And it is the power of that resurrection that Paul said, I want to know him and that power, that incredible power that he offers to us. Back in Ephesians chapter 1, if you've been reading the, uh, the, the Bible passages that we're reading as a church family, this morning we read Ephesians chapter 1. And as I was reading it early this morning, I came across this verse and I thought, well, that, that's, exactly what my, that's exactly what my message is about today. Listen to what verse 18 says. I pray that the perception of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the glorious riches of his, his inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. Paul said, I want to know him, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. There is no power on earth like the power of his resurrection. Not atomic power, not nuclear power, not any kind of military power, not any kind of political power. There is no power on earth like the power of the resurrection. And Paul said, I want to know him, and I want to know that power. But there's a second thing he says. Go back to it again. This is also in verse 10. He says, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Here's the second thing. And the fellowship of his sufferings. Now that's a strange thing to say. That is a strange thing to say. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and I want to fellowship in his suffering. I promise you that you will not hear a health, wealth, and prosperity preacher say that on the Big Hair Channel today. They're going to tell you that if you love God enough and you give enough money to their ministry, God's going to give you plenty of money and you're not going to get sick. And, and, and if, any of those, if, if you're getting sick, it's because you're not giving enough money and, and you're not praying right. And They're not going to tell you what Paul said in this passage. I want to know his power of the resurrection and I want to fellowship in his suffering. So if the first thing that he said is, I want to know his power, the second thing he said is, I want to fellowship in his pain. Now why did he say that? Why should we want to fellowship in the suffering of Christ? Well, there are a couple of things that come to mind. One is that when you love somebody, when they hurt, you hurt. When my wife hurts, I hurt. When I hurt, I think she hurts as well. When your children hurt, what parent would not take the place of a child? I would gladly take what you're going through. I would bear that burden if I could. I would take your place. We feel that pain because we love them. When you love someone, that's what happens. Paul said, I, I want to know him, and in knowing him, I want to experience his power, but I also want a fellowship in his suffering. What suffering did Jesus have? Well, he was rejected by his hometown. People in his family, many of his own family members thought he was insane. Everywhere he went, he was reminded that he was illegitimate. Finally, it came to the moment where he was taken and beaten within a, a, a lash of, of, of death and then nailed to a cross. And Paul said, I want a fellowship in that. Why should, we, why should we think that way? Well, let me read what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. This is in 2 Corinthians, the very opening of the book, first chapter. This is what he said. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Listen to this. He comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I've noticed something. When one of you has a death in your family, a spouse, a child, I can, I can come and stand with you. I can put my arm around you. I can tell you I'm so sorry. I can tell you I'm praying for you. I can read scripture to try to encourage you. But I haven't been there. And I've noticed something about people who lose a spouse. They are far more sensitive when other people go through that. 
and they're able to say, I know what you're going through. I've been there. I've noticed something about people who've lost a child in death. It's one thing for me to say, I am so sorry and I am praying for you and God will give you strength. But when someone else who's walked down that road comes alongside them and says, I've been there too. When you go through cancer, when you have a setback in life. Why do we go through those? Why, why should we even think about this fellowship of suffering idea? It's because when we've experienced those things, we're able to help someone else who's experiencing those things. God saw me through that and God will see you through that too. Your life is not over. This is not the end. Yes, your heart hurts. Yes, life is turned upside down, but God's grace is sufficient and he will meet you where you are. Paul said, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection and I want to know the fellowship of his suffering. I want to experience a little bit of the pain that he experienced so that I can pass that help along to other people. But look at the third thing he says. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Here's the third one. Assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Now, the word assuming will trouble some of you because you think that is a word of doubt. Assuming, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It's not a word of doubt. He's not saying, I'm not sure about this. It is a word of humility. What he's saying is, I don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve his forgiveness. I don't deserve his mercy. I don't deserve his love. And I don't deserve that when my life is over on earth that he would let me into heaven and give me eternal life forever and ever. I don't deserve that, yet that's what he's promised. That's what the word assuming means. It's, It's a statement of humility. But he says, I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Now, if the first statement was about power and the second statement was about pain, this third statement is about purpose. Some people go through life without any purpose, without any meaning, without any direction. They just kind of, every day is just the day. It's the day of itself and you just live that day. You just get through it. When you get through that day, if you make it till tomorrow, you'll get through tomorrow. And There's really no plan, no purpose, no vision, no dream. Paul said, I understand God's purpose in my life. You know, God has, a, God has a specific purpose for everybody in this room. God has a purpose for me. My calling from the time that I was a boy, my calling from God was to stand in front of people just like you and take God's word for God's people and say, thus saith the Lord. To introduce people to Jesus who will change their life. That's been God's call in my life. But God has a purpose for you too. Colossians chapter 3 says, whatever you do, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or a a contractor or an attorney or a doctor or a teacher, whatever it is you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it for him, whatever it is you do. God has a purpose for every one of us. But ultimately, you know what God's purpose is? This is what it's all about. God's purpose is that when we live our lives doing whatever you do, when we live our lives and we come to the end of the journey, whenever that is, 30 years old, 50 years old, 90 years old, you've lived your life, you come to the end of the journey and you die, that moment comes and your obituary is the one in the paper. And your friends are going to gather and Look at your human remains. And that final number is going to be chiseled into your tombstone. It's your death that they're talking about. God's purpose is that in that moment, all who love you will know that that is not the end. You lived your life on this earth 
You took your human body and now it has been returned to the earth because you don't need it anymore because God has taken you to a place where he will give you a new body and you will live with him forever and ever and ever in the place that God has prepared. Paul said, I want to know him and his power. I want to know him and his pain. And I want to know him and his purpose for my life that one day I will live for him in the place that he's prepared for me. You are aware, aren't you, that every person, every person on earth is going to live forever. You're either going to live in the presence of God because you've put your faith in Jesus or you are going to live separated from God in a terrible place that the Bible calls hell because you refuse to receive the gift that God offered in Jesus Christ. But every person's going to spend eternity somewhere. And the key is what you do with Jesus. I want to know him. I want to know him. We're going to sing a song in a minute. Greg's going to lead us in a song. You've heard it probably all your life. If I remember it right, it goes like this. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I'd be drifting like a ship without a sail. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Do you know him today? Don't turn him away. Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. I want to know him because he's the one who gives life. Let's pray. Lord, my prayer right now is that if someone's come into this service and they may know about Jesus, but they really cannot honestly say they know him, that they would leave here today with the burning desire to know him, that we would experience his power that we would even fellowship in his sufferings so that one day we will experience the resurrection and live forever in his purpose for us. I pray that every person here who says they know him, that they would leave more committed to know him more fully, to get to know him better in the days ahead. And I pray that in Jesus' name. We're going to sing in just a moment. Brandon is going to stand here with me. And if there's a response any of you would make, if you'd like to be a part of our church, if you'd like to talk with one of us about baptism, or you just have a prayer need, we'd love to pray with you. This is an opportunity for you to respond as the Lord would speak to you here in this moment. Let's stand together and sing this familiar hymn that Greg's going to lead us in. If the Lord leads you right now, this is your opportunity to respond. Without Him I could do nothing. Without Him I surely fail Without Him I would be drifting Like a ship without a sail Jesus, oh Jesus Do you know Turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I would be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Jesus, thank God I'm saved. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, with Without him, how lost I would be.
It is uh, so good to see you today. Thank you for being here. If you are a guest, I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you. I'm going to be right out in the lobby, right kind of straight in front of where I am right now. I've got a gift that I'd like to give you. If you're new to our church, particularly if this is your first day here, or maybe you've got company with you, please stop by and let me say hello and give you that gift. Thank you for being here. I hope you have a great afternoon. By the way, there is a meeting tonight at 6 o'clock at uh, the First Baptist Church of Gallatin. They're on Main Street just past the courthouse. And uh, uh, Kevin Ezel, who is the president of the North American Mission Board, uh, is going to be speaking at that meeting. It's our annual meeting for the Bledsoe Baptist Association, the churches of uh, uh, Sumner, Macon, and Trousdale County. You're invited to that meeting. Starts at 6 o'clock. Love to see you there. Kevin Ezel is a great speaker and was at one time pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hartsville uh, over uh, on, uh, on the other side of Gallatin and uh, so it'll be good to have Kevin back and have him speaking tonight you're welcome to come and be a part of that Greg let's sing together the greatest thing in all my life is knowing you the greatest thing in all my life is knowing you I want to know to know you more the greatest thing in all my life is knowing you have a great week see you next time Jesus, you came to my room.